What's up guys? Today we're gonna to be talking about HTML. I wanna help you understand what HTML is and then also jump into some code and show you some examples of the most popular HTML elements that you're gonna see out in the wild. HTML is a markup language. Uh, so HTML basically is the structure of your website. Let's say you want a navigation bar at the very top of your web page that says home and about and contact us. You're going to use HTML to write those three things out. And then you're going to have a section underneath it that maybe has an image and you're going to use HTML to display that image. And then underneath that, let's say you have uh, some products that you want to show people. If you're building an e-commerce site, you're going to use HTML to mark up those products. So HTML is the core of any website. It is the structure of any website. And that is what the browser reads when displaying your website and how your website is displayed. So if that didn't make any sense at all, hang in there. We're going to jump into some code and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. In the description below, there is a link to a GitHub repository that includes a master and a starter file for you to follow along with. I recommend you open up the starter folder and get into the starter file that looks exactly like this and follow along. Otherwise, there is a master file in there if you just want to listen and follow along that way. So before we jump into all of this good stuff that you see on the screen here, I want to talk to you a little bit about HTML. HTML consists of several different elements. And what I mean by elements is uh, for paragraphs and for line breaks and for headings and for creating links, it's all different elements. The browser reads these elements differently and the browser needs to know what this element is supposed to look like or do. And that's how you're gonna structure your website. So for a paragraph, we're gonna use what we call a P tag. And tags have an opening tag and a closing tag. And this is what they look like. So an opening tag for a P tag is a less than symbol, the letter P, and then a greater than symbol. And then there's a closing tag that is a less than symbol, a forward slash, the letter P, and a greater than symbol. And then all of your contents, your paragraph is going to go right in the middle. So let's say the P tag is for uh, typing paragraphs. Now I'm going to show you what this looks like in the browser. And in order to do that, I'm using a VS code extension called live server. If you want to download that for yourself, it's actually just going to be over here on the left hand side. It's the bottom icon in this group of five right here. Click that type in live server, and then it's going to be this extension right here. Go ahead and install this reload VS code, and then you're going to have live server installed. And what that does is it's gonna put a button down here, um, right here, I'll turn mine off. It says go live. What you're gonna do is just click that and it's gonna start this right in the browser. It's gonna automatically start this file up in the browser on port uh, 5500. And now we're gonna see here, we have the P tag is for typing paragraphs. It's exactly what we typed. So a P tag by default, uh, the way the browser reads it is it inserts a blank line before and after each element. So if we were to put another P tag here and uh, we say by default, there is a blank line before and after each element, save that. I'm going to come over here and refresh. You'll see that there is space in between these two elements. Uh, where it says the P tag is for typing paragraphs. And then we have this sentence here. There's space in between there. Um, and that's the browser is automatically adding space in between these paragraphs. So that is a paragraph tag. So if you ever want to just type a big long sentence or a paragraph, slap it in a P tag. So next it says line break, but I'm actually going to uh, do this div first. And then we'll come back to line breaks. So a div... A div is, it, it's a container. It divides the content on your website. Um, a div is used for to put a plethora of other HTML elements inside of a div. And so a div, the opening and closing tags look just like this. And we can say a div divides content on your website. 
Let's save that, come over here, and now we have this pop up, a div uh, divides content on your website. And this div, by default, spans the entire width of the page. Uh, just like a paragraph text, uh, it spans the entire width of the page. So even if your sentence is only half of the width of the page, the whole element spans the entire width of the page. Um, so if we put another div up underneath this, uh, let's do another div here and say a div is used as a container for any other HTML element. I'm going to try to put sentences inside of these HTML elements that help describe uh, what these elements are so you have that for future reference. Now if we refresh this page, you'll see that uh, this div popped up right up underneath the other div, but there is no space in between these two divs. Um, so you, now you see what I mean by a paragraph that has uh, a blank line before and after it, it separates the elements. A div does not do that. A div is just a container, and you're gonna add the styling later on. Uh, but for now, we're just talking about HTML, and a div is just a block-level element, which means it spans the entire width of the page. It's a, just a block that has a bunch of stuff inside of it. Now, line breaks. A line break looks just like this. All a line break does is it's going to put a blank line in between wherever uh, wherever this line break is. So this line break is in between this P tag and this div. So now if we refresh, you're gonna see additional space in between these two blocks right here. So you'll see that this pop down, all it's doing is adding a blank line on your website. It's add another one and you'll see this pop down even more. So that is a really good way to separate out content is to just add these line breaks. And these line breaks don't have an opening and closing tag. Uh, these line breaks, let's close this over here so we get more space. These line breaks don't have an opening and closing tag. And that is because there is no contents that go in between a line break. A line break is just a blank line we're not going to be putting any text in there. There is nothing that needs to go in the middle of this. So a line break doesn't have a opening and closing tag. A line break is just simply greater than BR. And then when you have a self-closing tag, which is what this means, it has a forward slash and then a greater than symbol. And that is a self-closing tag. So now moving on to headings. A heading is like a title on your website. So the first heading we're gonna talk about is like a main heading that you would put at the very top of your page, and that is an H1, which is heading one. So if we do heading one, and we come over here and refresh this page, you will see that this heading is bold and very large. So this looks like the title at the top of a website. Now there are six different headings. Um, so let's do a H2, heading two, and I'm actually just going to uh, copy and paste these down and we're gonna do sixes. So let's do uh, three, four, five, six. And now if we take a look at this, we refresh this page over here, these headings get smaller and smaller as they go down to six. And so you're gonna use these different headings as different titles on your website. So heading one, like I said, is probably gonna go at the very top of your web page. And then as you are describing different sections on that web page, you're gonna be using heading two and heading three. Those are two of the more popular ones, four, five, and six. You don't see all that often, but they are there for you to use them as well. I'm actually gonna throw some line breaks in between all of these so we can separate out our HTML elements. Okay, so a horizontal rule. A horizontal rule is just a line that's going to go from the left to the right side of your screen. And a horizontal rule 
is a self-closing tag because there are no contents that go in between this. And now when we refresh the page, you'll see we have this line that just goes across your website. So that is a horizontal rule. And let's put some line breaks in between there. A link is a button that a user is going to click that's gonna take them to a different page. And what I mean by internal link, let's say you have home, uh, a home page and an about page. That about page is an internal link because they are the user is staying on your website um, when they click that about button. An external link is a link that's going to go to a different website. So they're gonna leave your website and go to a different website. So that, that is what an external link is. But first let's talk about internal links. The HTML element for an internal link is an anchor tag or an A tag. And that is just the letter A. And we need to include something called an href here. I'll talk about that in just a second. And then we're gonna say about. So this has an opening and closing tag and about is going to be right here. Let's save this and refresh the page. And now you'll see this about text that pops up over here. And this looks like a link that you might see on a website. You know that because it's underlined, and this is actually purple because I've clicked it already, but it would normally be blue, uh, that this is something a user can click. Now, if we were to click this, it's not gonna take us anywhere. That's what this href is for. This href defines where the user is going to go when they click that about button. So if we wanted to go to an about page, we might say about. We don't actually have an about page um, that we can go to, but if a user were to click this, you would see the link up on the top here change and it would try to take the user to an about page on your website. External links, same exact anchor tag here, we still need the href. And here we'll say, we'll, we'll take a user to Google. So we're gonna go to HTTPS www.google.com. It is the same thing as an internal link, but now we are linking the user to go outside of our website. So let's refresh that. And now we have this Google link here. If we were to click that, we actually go to the Google website. A span is kind of like a div. It can be looked at as a container. A span looks just like this. It has an opening and closing tag. Uh, let's put span can be looked at as a container. Now a span by default only spans the width of the content inside of it. So uh, let's let's put some line breaks in between some of these elements here so we can separate all of this out so if we were to put another span up underneath this uh, let's say span is similar to a div but does not span the entire page now you're going to see what i mean by that when i refresh this page the text is actually going to show up right to the right of this text so a span is only the width of the contents inside of it. Remember when we did this with the div, we did the same thing with the divs up here. We put uh, two divs right up underneath each other. And on the website, they wound up one up underneath the other. Spans don't do that because spans only are the same width of the contents inside of it. Images now can be internal and external, just like links can be. If you have an internal image, for instance, inside of this uh, repo that you cloned, there's a dog.jpg image here. This is an internal image that we have right here. An external image is like an image that you get, uh, that you are pointing to from a, a different website. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So first, an image tag, is IMG. Now inside of this IMG tag, we're gonna need something called SRC, which is a source, and alt, uh, which I'll get to here in just a minute. An image tag, by the way, is self-closing. 
since there's actually no content in an image tag, an image tag just points to an image somewhere either internal or external, there's no content in it. So this is a self-closing tag. Now the source is the image that you want to display. So here I'm going to go slash dog.jpg and that's pointing to this image right here. So now if I were to come over here and refresh the page, you'll see that now we have this image of a dog. I keep forgetting to put these line breaks in here to separate these out. Okay, so now we have an image of a dog here. This alt text is very important. Uh, people who need assistance with reading a website, uh, let's see, people who might be blind or can't see very well, they use something called a screen reader. And that screen reader starts from the top of your website and reads down your website from left to right and down and describes to that user what they're looking at. So this alt text, when a, that screen reader gets to this image, that alt text is what that screen reader actually reads. So here you want to put something meaningful that describes what this image is. I'm just going to put a dog. So now when that screen reader were to, uh, were to land on this image, it's going to describe this image to that user as a dog. So the user knows there's a picture of a dog on the website. External images is also an IMG tag and it is a self-closing tag. Same attributes here. We have our source attribute and our alt attribute. Source now though is going to point to a external image. Internal images because we have this right here with us. External image points to somewhere different. So I'm just going to copy and paste this uh, this website here, Unsplash. Unsplash is a website where you can get free images to use. Uh, and so I'm just going to use this that generates a random image every time you refresh the page. So let's take a what, look at what that looks like now. So if I were to refresh the page, we get an image here that pops up that comes directly from this Unsplash website. Now you can also use HTML to bold text and make it italic and make it underlined as well. So bold text, you just put inside of a B tag and let's say bold text. And let's go over here and take a look. Now we have text that is bold. Italic text goes in an I tag. Let's save it, refresh, and now we have italic text. Throw some line breaks underneath there. Underline text, you probably guessed it, is in a U tag. Underlined text. Let's refresh that. And now we have text that's underlined. So you can use HTML to actually style your text a little bit. Now you can actually put tags inside of other tags. Like we said, the div and the span act like containers. And what do you do with a container? You usually put things inside of it. So let's see what that looks like. Let's do a span and we're going to put three different other HTML elements inside of the span. We're going to put italic text, bold text, and underline text all in the span. So let's type out a sentence. You can put we're going to now throw this I tag, italic text, or bold text, or I'm going to put the U tag for underlined text in the middle of a sentence. Send in the middle of a sentence. Okay. Now let's throw some line breaks up underneath that underlined text, refresh the page, and you'll see here it says you can put italic text or bold text or underlined text in the middle of a sentence. And these additional tags, the I tag, the B tag, and the U tag did style these differently. So you can put HTML elements inside other HTML elements. Small text is inside of a small tag. 
and we're going to say here this is small text so small text if we refresh the page oh we forgot to put our line breaks in there if we refresh the page this text is slightly smaller than the rest of the text that you see on the website and this is used mostly for um, let's say you have a login screen and on that login screen you have a username and password and that password up underneath that input where a user types their password you might say something like we do not store passwords so it's not really important text but you want it on your website so a user can see that it's there that's what you're going to use small text for let's say you have a list that you want on your website there are two different lists there's an unordered list and an ordered list and what i mean by unordered list is uh, it's just going to be a list of bullet points, basically, not necessarily anything you need to do in uh, step by step. But let's say we're listing out a recipe and we're saying these are all the ingredients you need. We can use bullet points for that so we can use an unordered list. But when we get to the steps to cooking, then we're going to need an ordered list because the user or the person cooking is going to need to do these things step by step. So an unordered list is in a HTML element called UL. Inside of this UL, we're going to then put an LI for the list. So UL says this is an unordered list, and now we have to put all of our bullet points in these LI tags. Um, so we can say this is an uh, unordered list. Um, I'm going to copy this down twice. And now refresh the page and you'll see that this now is in a bullet point. So this is an unordered list. Ordered list, I'm actually just going to copy and paste this, is the same exact thing except the element that it's in is an OL for ordered list. Uh, let's throw some break tags in here and refresh the page and now you'll see it's the same list but it comes out as one two three instead of bullet points so this is now ordered you need to do these things in order of one two and three a table is also something that you're going to see a lot of on different websites a table can get a little bit more complex with html but hang in there we're going to walk through it step by step a table is inside of a table element inside of table if you think about the structure of a table a table has headings and then underneath those headings it has rows of data or whatever you're going to have in your table so first we need to define the heading and that is in an html element called t head inside of t head we need to now say that this is going to be a row we're going to have a row of headings so we need to say tr for table row and now the html element for a heading in a table is th so let's build a table of state names and their abbreviations so let's say state name we want that to be one heading in our table and then we want another heading called abbreviation let's save that and refresh and now you'll see that we have these state name and abbreviation it just looks like bolded text side by side but it's going to be important that it is set up like this when we get into the body of the table so when we do the body of a table it is in t body t head the head of a table is in t head the body is in t body and it's going to be the same structure now inside of the body we need to say this is a row in this table so tr for table row and now instead of th like we did up here when we said this is the table heading we're going to do td for table data so now this first heading was state name so the very first thing i need in this row is the state name we'll go colorado and then abbreviation is next so we need another td for table data and we'll say co now let's go and refresh this and you'll see colorado landed right up underneath state name 
and CO landed under abbreviation. The order is important. If I were to flip these and put CO first, refresh the page, and now it says CO is the state name. It doesn't match what is up here in the order that it's supposed to be in. So make sure that your order is correct. So that is the basics of a table. Tables can get a lot more complex, but we're gonna leave it at that. That is the basic table, and that's all we need to know for now. A form now is also a little bit more complex, but hang in there. So a form is in a form tag. A form tag has two very important attributes, action and method. We're going to talk about method just a little bit later. That's actually what these comments are right here, but we're going to talk about that in just a second. Action is when, when you submit this form, where is that data going to go to? You're going to have to do something with the data in that form. So let's say you have a login form and you need to check to see if that username and that password are correct. You need that data to go somewhere. Action is where that data is going to go. So let's say you have a file called login. We don't have a file called login, but let's say we did and inside of that file. That's when we look at the username and data and make sure it's right. So action points to where that data is going to go. A form, if you think about it, has a label and then an input for a user to type something. So our first element in here is going to be label. And we're actually going to put some B tags here because I want this to be bold. And the first thing we're going to put is email. Now the label has an important attribute as well. And we're going to say for email. Now this for is going to be important when we build our input. So an input is another HTML element. Input has a couple of important attributes. The first one's gonna be type. Text is probably the most popular type, but there are other types. The type we're gonna use for email is email. And if we put email as a type, the browser is going to do some checks when a user submits this input, it's going to check to make sure that this is a valid email address. So if somebody tries to put something in the email field that is not an email address, the browser is going to throw an error and it's going to say, this needs to be an email address. Please fix it before you submit your form. So that type there is important. And then we're going to name it and we're going to name of email. Now, Input is a self-closing tag because there are no contents that go inside of this input that we are going to put in as a developer. The user is going to put the information in there. So now let's come over here, refresh it, and you see we have this email. That's the label that is in the bold text. And then we have an input for a user to type something. And you'll see when I click this, I actually get some examples that I've used before uh, for my emails and other testing emails. So the browser knows that this is an email input and gives you suggestions on what you can put in there. Just makes it a little bit easier for the user. So now let's move on and let's do another label. This label is going to be for password because password is the next input we're going to put on our screen. Uh, let's do bold text again and put password here. And then up underneath this, we're going to put an input. Remember inputs are self-closing tags. And the it, we need two attributes here. We need a type and a name. This type is actually going to be password. Now when a browser sees the type of password, it's actually going to hide the password as you type it. It's gonna be little bullet points. Um, and then let's give this a name of password. So now we have this password here. And when I type, you can't see the letters that are in it. And that's because of this type of password. And now we need a way to submit this form. And that's actually going to be another input tag. But this time it's a type of submit. And this one needs another attribute called value. This value is what the button is going to say. So we're going to say submit here. 
refresh the page, and now we have this button down here that says submit. We could change this value, add a bunch of T's, and now there's a bunch of T's here in the submit. But this type is, again, is important. The browser knows that this is a button that's going to submit this form. And when you click this submit button, it looks at, looks at this action, and that's where it goes. Now let's talk about the method for a form. There are two different methods you can use, which are get and post. So when you use get as the method, we're going to type get right here. And what git does is it will take the email and the password. It will throw those in the URL of your website. And that's how it, they are accessed once we get to this login file right here. We grab them out of the URL. So you can imagine for an email and password, that's probably not the best way to do it because you don't want the email and password fully visible up here in the URL. Uh, so let's just take a look at what this is like let's say example at example.com i'm going to put one two three four five six as the password and i'm going to make this bigger so we can see the url up here at the top i'm going to submit this and we don't actually have this slash login page so it's going to give us an error but you'll see the email example at example.com and then the password of one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't ever want to pass any sensitive data up in the URL. So we're not going to use Git for that. Git can be useful for things like a search box. When you want to search for something on a website, you type it into a search box and you submit it. And then that search query pops up in the URL so you know, the user knows what they search. That is one example of using a Git method. But the other method is post. Post is the method you're going to want to use for a login form for an email and a password. So let's uh, let's refresh this page here and let's make it larger. So let's open up our developer tools now. You can right click on the screen and go to inspect. This is going to pop this up. I'm actually going to dock this right here. So now, when we're in our developer tools, I want you to click on this network tab. This network tab is going to track our email and password. And this is how we pass this information now. So let's type example at example.com. And let's do 987654 to make it different than before. So now when I click submit, you'll see it did not show up in the URL. It tried to go to this login page that doesn't exist. But down here, we have this login that says failed because this file doesn't exist. But if you click on this, and let's make this a little bit bigger, and we go to payload, now you'll see the email and password. This is how it was sent. So now the login form is actually going to access the payload of this form, and that's how it's gonna access the email and the password. This is way more safe than passing the email and the password up in the search bar because a user is not gonna be able to see this unless you have this open and click on it uh, when you submit a form. So your email and password is just not gonna be out in the open for everybody to see. So those are the post and get methods for submitting forms and i did include some information about them up here in these comments uh, so you have that for future reference uh, let's actually get off of the login page and go back here close out our developer tools so the very last thing that i want to show you let's throw some break tags um, some line breaks in here is a select box and these typically go inside of a form as well. If you want a user to select from a couple of different options, instead of just typing something in, so let's say um, we want a user to select the state that they're from, you're gonna use a select box. You don't always just want to rely on the user to properly spell out the state that they live in. They might have a typo. They may also just put something obscene in there. 
um, you want to give them options to select from. So we're going to use a select box. That is in a select HTML element. We're going to give this a name, just like we did in input. And let's say states. And this name now is important as well. So when we submit this, uh, we're actually going to get the data out by the name that this select has. Uh, and inside of a select box, it has options, which is in an option. Let's say Colorado. And then you want to give this a value. And we'll say like CO, for instance, if we wanted the abbreviation to be the value. So let's refresh this. And now we have a select box with Colorado as an option. Now when this gets submitted, what gets submitted is this value. So if you wanted to get the state abbreviation codes and use that on your back end instead of using the full state, you can do that. You can change this value to whatever you want this value to be. The user is not going to see that, but they're going to see what's inside of this option. So let's do maybe a couple more. Let's do um, Minnesota and Kentucky. And let's change these values, MN and KY. Let's refresh the page over here. Now when I click this, now I have three options. So this is a good way to prevent the user from typing in something and giving them specific options to choose from. So that is the very basics of HTML. We went through some of the really popular HTML elements that you're gonna see as you're reading through code or as you're actually writing code. I hope you got something out of this video. If you wanna learn a little bit about styling HTML elements and making your website look a little bit prettier, I do have a link in the description for a video on CSS, which is the language we use to style a website. So if you wanna check that out, go ahead and click that link. Otherwise, I hope you have a really awesome rest of your day.